next week, I'm going to be talking about fabrics, some information you may or may not know. And also, I've got this fabulous product, a sassy clip. And I can't wait to show you how you can use this with your sewing. So let's get going on this week's More Sewing with Michelle. So let's talk about this wonderful um, tool that we have for our sewing room called the Sassy Clip. Now the Sassy Clip basically um, will clip onto any surface. You need to have a ledge and you can see it just clips right on. And you already know the advantages of this. Get your drinks, get lots of things off of the countertop that will create more room for your sewing or your crafting. It also helps to keep things organized um, and in its own place. I love it. Now this sassy clip has a heavy duty spring in there that really supports. It will not slip. As you can see, it will not ruin the surface of your furniture. The maximum thickness that this sassy clip can open is one and a fourth inch. And the opening for what you want to put in there is two and three quarters inches. So these things are great for multiple places in your house or even outside of your house. Think of this, you can put it on your boat, you can put it um, in your car, your RV, anywhere that has a ledge or even just like in the backyard if you have a table or something and you wanna get um, the drinks or whatever you have off of the table. Now this is also, my family, we love to play card games and we do it a lot. There's lots of different games that we play with cards. And of course, you do not want water on the table when you're playing cards because then the cards will stick and it can also um, mess with your cards. So perfect thing for playing cards. I think if you think about it, the usages for this sassy clip are gonna be astronomical. There's just lots of stuff that you can do with it. Now I wanted to show you, um, that you know your 505 will fit in there perfectly i also i have um my favorite drink um and it will hold any type of liquid it is not particular if you put my favorite drink of water in there or if it happens to be something mixed or a cocktail it doesn't care so you can see my water in there holds perfectly and that's a nice tall glass of water um cans of Coke or any other um, liquid. Um, but think outside the box too. If you wanna just keep things organized, you can have your lotion in there. Um, if you had it in a craft room, you can use these and hold your spools. So think outside the box with these. There's gonna be lots of things that you can do with these wonderful sassy clips. And I thought they were a great tool, um, pretty important, keeping your work space clean and organized, but also I know that we've talked about this before as far as maintenance. You wanna make sure that you always keep liquids away from your sewing machine and it's super important. And I'm gonna go over in a little bit what can happen to your machine and how if something does get in your machine, how to kind of take care of it. But you wanna make sure that when you're sewing that you have your drink put aside and out of the way because if that was to drip spill and get in your machine. It's not a good thing. So that's why these wonderful sassy clips, like I said, super easy to use. Um, anyone can use them, a child all the way up. They're not heavy to um, push down on that spring and get them clipped on. And they're just a great, fun, handy tool for you to have in your sewing room. So sassy clips. And now I wanna talk to you a little bit more about what happens if water does get in your sewing machine. Okay, so I wanna talk about water and your sewing machine. And first off, you can see, I always stay hydrated throughout the day, which means when I sew, I always have my cup of water with me, pretty much so wherever I go in the house. But with that said, I always keep my water away from my sewing machine. and. That's why I thought these sassy clips were such a great thing to bring on to more sewing with Michelle because it can get your drink away from your machine. So you won't have, um, you'll have less possibility, I should say, of water getting in your machine. 
Now, we all know, depending upon where you live in the country, there's lots of factors that can happen that can get water in your machine. Um, if you have a flood in your house, if a pipe breaks, I mean, it can drip onto the machine if it's on a ground floor and you actually have flooding, a natural disaster. Um, if you're careless and you spill your, your coffee or your water or your soda, whatever it is, onto um, your sewing machine. You want to make sure that you follow some basic steps so that you can preserve what's there, take care of it as fast as you can so that you can save the life of your machine. Now, I view my sewing machine, they are an essential, um, they're not a tool, but they're an essential machine. They're essential to my happiness. Um, they help keep me sane, they keep me going, and I know that I am not alone in this, that all of you feel the same way, that um, something was to happen to your sewing machine, that you, it would be, it would not be a good day. It would be very sad. They are an investment, um, depending upon what machine you have. Um, talking thousands of dollars putting into them. So we want to protect them, which is why preventative maintenance is huge. Use your sassy clip, make sure your drinks are away. But like I said, there's times where moisture of water, something drips in it that gets in it, and we want to make sure that we um, can take care of that problem as soon as possible. So in a hypothetical situation, um, we're going to say I spilled water into my machine. And the first thing you want to do is turn off the machine. Now, most modern machines with all this new technology that do um, amazing things, um, they're all based on you know computer, electronics, so you're gonna wanna, first thing you do is turn off your machine as fast as you can, and that will help. Now, the next thing you wanna do is unplug your machine. So, I'm gonna pull my power cord out so now my machine is unplugged. So that takes care of any electricity that could go through the machine. Now the next thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to open that machine up as, as much as you can to get the air moving. Now let me talk a little bit about preventative maintenance before. I know that I've had it where I've explained how I keep my machines clean on a um, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. But with that, um, cleaning out your bobbin case and making sure that the lint buildup is taken care of is going to be really important in this situation. Because if water gets down into the bed of my machine here, then those fibers that collect from when you sew, and it doesn't matter what type of sewer you are, there will be fibers that get down into the bobbin case area. Um, they will absorb that water. And as they absorb them and they sit there for a period of time, it can promote rusting. And rusting, ooh, we don't want that on the insides of our sewing machines. We don't want it on the outside either, but we do not want rust at all inside your sewing machines. So what I suggest is you open the machine up the most that you can um, at home. So I'm going to turn around. Let me get this out of the way so that I can do this. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off my toolbox. I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to put my sassy clip on this other side here so that my drink's out of the way. And then I am going to expose my bobbin case area. And I am going to take out my bobbin and the bobbin case. And that way that'll help to get airflow to the bottom of your machine. So you want to make sure that as much as you can on this Janome, I could actually open this up here, which if it spilled down below, um, that would take care of that. But if it is dripping from above, you want to open it up as much as you can. Open your door so that the airflow is going and it's not, um, that moisture isn't just going to sit and cause rust. Now, the next thing that I highly suggest once you take care of the first part is that you look into a service center. You want to protect your investment. So, you know, in my situation, I'm going to be calling Moore's Sewing Centers, and we have five locations in Southern California. But if you happen to not live here in Southern California, um, keep in mind you're going to want to find a sewing machine service center that services your, your make of machine. So I would call around, find out 
um, who you want to take it to. And then I would just explain to them, you know, X, Y, Z happened. Um, moisture and water got in my machine. I have unplugged it. I have opened it up. And when can I bring it in and go from there? Hopefully you can take it in that same day and, you know, get the service part of it going right away. Now, if something happens, it's on a weekend, stores aren't open, um, you're in an area where you don't have access to a sewing machine store, the next thing I would suggest to you is that you get some fans and have fans blow in on your machine to help the process of drying it out. And that is what you're gonna wanna do until you can get it to a professional service center. Um, and that way you can make sure that they can take care of everything, clean everything up, make sure all that lint is out of that machine that isn't gonna hold that moisture and cause and promote rusting. So things happen. You know, like I said, it could be a natural disaster. It could be um, a grandkid running by. It could be lots of different things. It doesn't matter how it happened. But what you want to know is the steps that you can do to help yourself if you're ever in that unfortunate situation where moisture does get into your machine. Remember, turn off your machine one, open your machine up, unplug it, um, make sure that... Um, you know, you get whatever dust you can get out of there um, and then call your service center and get it in for service. And if not, put some fans on it until you can get it into a service center. And that's the basics of um, when something happens to your sewing machine with water. Okay, so don't forget to go to the More Sewing with Michelle landing page where you can click on the link in the description of this video and you can purchase this wonderful sassy clip. You also have the option to go to moors-sew.com and you can click on the link for the More Sewing with Michelle landing page to pick up this wonderful and very useful tool, the sassy clip. Now also, I talked a little bit about service centers and Moors has five locations here in Southern California to serve you. We have the Temecula, Brea, Huntington Beach, Corona, and also Mission Viejo. Those are our five locations. You can find out more information on moors-so.com and you can bring your service in for your machine in for service at one of our wonderful locations. And don't forget this wonderful sassy clip. So, as promised, I'm going to talk a little bit about fabrics today. Now, often when I um, am doing my videos, I may say things like pre-shrunk, tone-on-tone, and um, sometimes I get feedback that, what's tone-on-tone? So, I wanted to talk a little bit about different um, ways that fabric are sold. Now, we know that you can go to a fabric store and buy yard cuts or even down to quarter or one-eighth, depending upon the fabric store that you go to. But what I want to talk about is one of the biggest questions that I have um, when I'm teaching is pre-shrunk. Do I need to wash my fabrics? And it's a little, I don't want to say it's controversial, but depending upon who you, who you talk to, you may get a completely different answer. But what I'm going to do is give you the information that I have from my years of quilting and sewing and provide it to you. And then, as usual, you can make up your own mind and decision about it. Now, with modern technology, the way that fabrics are created are totally different than they were um, 20 years ago or so. And it used to be that the dyes that were used um, in the production of making fabrics um, would sometimes run. And you would have that problem with reds particularly and sometimes blue. So they weren't as color fast and those colors didn't stick so much to the fabrics. So it was always recommended that you pre-wash your fabric to get rid of the excess dye in the fabric. Now, with modern fabric um, technology, the way that they print and the inks that they use, I don't feel that that is necessary anymore, and there's a big community that agrees with me. Now, with that said, I will be completely honest here. There have been, I think, three quilts that I have created that um, 
I used my color catchers because I always use color catchers when I wash my quilts um, where there was a lot of color that was moving when I had washed my quilts. So now does that mean that that fabric was defective when it was made? The dyes were inferior? I'm not really sure. But with that said, with the amount of things that I have created over the years, having only three things that were problematic, I'm still going to not pre-wash my things. I like that my fabrics have the sizing in them. When you purchase a fabric, it has that sizing, and that helps to keep those fibers nice and crisp so that it's easier to sew, easier to cut, easier to work with. So I do not pre-wash any of my um, cotton quilting fabric when I'm going to create with it. Now, what I want to talk about is a little bit about um, tone-on-tones also. Now, tone-on-tone is um, probably one of my favorite types of fabrics because they're so useful in um, embroidery or quilting. They give a little bit of punch of color, but you're not overwhelmed with design, so to speak. So this is a tone-on-tone -tone here, and you will see tone-on-tone -tone meaning that it is like, it's like a raspberry color, but it's got a little bit of a darker raspberry on that. We also have this pink. It has a design, and it's basically two colors of pink, and then we also have this one that's a little bit peachy. So all three of these are considered tone-on-tones. Now, tone-on-tones are used a lot in quilting. You'll see that I hold all three of them up at one time. Now, what they do is they give a little punch of color. Most tone-on-tones um, will have smaller prints, and that way it's easier to work them in with a large design print fabric or also any other type of fabric line. And that's why I love my tone-on-tones because instead of buying, um, if you see the way that normal fabric artists, um, they create a line of fabrics that's in their collection. So there may be 20 different fabrics in this collection. Um, and I may have fallen in love with three of them from their collection. So now I can grab those three fabrics that I fell in love with, and then I add in my other tone-on-tone -tone fabrics to give more workability as far as how I create my quilts. And you'll see that in generally in the fabric collection line, there will be tone-on-tones in there too. Um, it's very rare. I know with my K facet fabrics and also um, sometimes Tula Pinks, there'll be nothing but, you know, lots of detailed, fun, vibrant prints. But um, I often, well, like I said, I collect my tone-on-tones. And if you saw in my video, my room, I had lots of area dedicated to the different um, color groups and my tone-on-tones. So I use them. So that's why I love tone-on-tones in a nutshell. Now I want to talk a little bit about other types of fabrics. Now pre-cut fabrics, it's a big thing and it does save you a lot of time to buy fabrics that are cut to a certain size. Now a lot of people get a little bit confused with a fat quarter and what a fat quarter means. Now a fat quarter, here's one here that I have, it's a fat quarter, and it's basically, it's if you were to go to a fabric store and say you want a quarter of a yard, they're going to cut a nice skinny, skinny quarter section of a yard. But a fat quarter is taking a full yard and then you get one fourth of it. So that's where it comes from. And you can see um, it's a very popular way of purchasing fabric. Now, oftentimes, if you're working on a quilt, you may only need a small piece of fabric. And that's where the beauty of fat quarters come in. You don't have to buy a full yard. You don't have to buy a half yard. You can get away with just that fat quarter and get useful fabric that you can use in your product. Now, fat quarters also come in bundles. So you will see um, pretty much so all quilt stores, um, they have fat quarter bundles. And it's a nice convenient way to purchase a line of fabrics like I was just talking about. This one here is a Riley Blake collection. And you can see there's 12 different fabrics, lots of different options in there. And it's just a fun and convenient way to purchase some fabrics for your quilting or embroidery. Now also, one of my favorite things are charm packs. Now I find that I gravitate to like five inch squares. I don't know why, I think it's, it's not big, it's not small, but I love purchasing these charm packs and I've got a ton of them. 
Um, they come in the full line from that collection, so you can see they have lots of variety in there. And it just gives you a little punch of color. But what I often do is I will buy my little charm packs, and once again, I will work in my tone on tones to give me even more of a variety of fabric. Now, charm packs, generally there's about 42 pieces in there. Depending upon the maker of the particular package of the charm pack, you could have um, a variety of the same actual fabric, or it can be different colorways of that same pattern, or it could be completely different fabrics. It all is different. I have not found um, charm packs that are completely the same. So what I like to do is flip through them, get a good gauge as far as what the prints are like in your charm pack. Um, there are a couple times where you'll see where the charm pack is completely um, encased and enclosed. Um, so that's a little bit harder, but you can oftentimes go online and um, put in the name of the charm pack and it'll give you little um, pictures of each of the different patterns included in this particular collection. Charm packs are great and I hope that you take a chance and find some of those too. Now the next thing I want to talk to is probably, I want to say it may be the most popular um, pre-cut fabric and that is a jelly roll and you can see where it gets its name jelly roll because these fabrics are completely rolled up and it kind of looks like a yummy um, this one would be a candy colored jelly roll um, this one um, has most jelly rolls have about once again 42 different pieces now a jelly roll is two and a half inch strip by the woof which we talked about last time W-O-F is width of fabric, so it's two and a half by the full length of the fabric, the woof of the fabric, and then you have 42 pieces. And once again, this is going to be the collection from that designer, or there are times where um, it'll be completely one color, or it will be a variety of different fabrics that someone's made a collection for you. So it all depends upon where you find your jelly roll and um, and who made it as far as what's in there. But once again, I love jelly rolls because you can get a little preview just by turning them as far as what fabrics are in there. So that is a jelly roll. Now there's one more, um, and I know I have other, other um, prepackaged, um, pre-cut fabrics downstairs. These are just the popular ones. This is a layer cake. Now a layer cake is just kind of like a charm pack, except it's bigger. They are 10 by 10 inch squares, and they will vary. Most of them, once again, will have 42 different pieces in there, um, depending upon. This is um, one of my favorite designers, Tula Pinks. This is Tula Pinks, too, but I love to go through them, and um, they, they vary. You can see that there's different amounts of fabrics in each. But you can get the great thing, let me, let me just, I want to explain this real quick. The great thing about a layer cake is if you have a design on a fabric line and it's really big, um, a layer cake, you're going to be able to see more of the design that the designer put on that fabric than, say, a charm pack. So a large print is going to be so much better for you in a layer cake than it would be in a charm pack. And I have bought charm packs, loved the, the design on the fabric, and then you get that charm pack and, you know, um, if it's an animal, you know, half the monkey may be off of where the center is. So that's when layer cakes really become super useful. And if you're a beginner sewer quilter, a layer cake is a perfect way to start to make a quilt because putting in 10 by 10 inch blocks, sewing them together, you're going to get a really beautiful quilt that's coordinated already by a designer and it's just going to come together without a hitch. So anyways, that's just a little tidbit more of information about fabric. So we talked about um, pre-washing. I don't pre-wash. We talked about my favorite um, fabric that I, I literally never say no to is my tone on tones. And then also we had the fat quarters, the jelly rolls, the charm packs, and also the layer cakes. So that's it for this week's um, fabric chat. And um, okay, so that is another wrap for another week of more sewing with Michelle. 
Thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with me. And don't forget to check out at moresewing.com as well as clicking on the link in the landing page where you can pick up that wonderful, useful sassy clip. Until next week, I hope you have a fabulous week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.